You're listening to The Philosopher's Note on your erroneous zones. More wisdom in less time. Hi, this is Brian. Welcome to The Philosopher's Notes on your erroneous zones. Escape negative thinking and take control of your life by Dr. Wayne W. Dyer. Start with a quote. With death so endless a proposition, and life so breathtakingly brief, ask yourself, should I avoid doing the things I really want to do? Should I live my life as others want me to? Are things important to accumulate? Is putting it off the way to live? Chances are your answers can be summed up in a few words. Live. Be you. Enjoy. Love. End quote. Again, that's Wayne Dyer from Your Erroneous Zones. So Your Erroneous Zones was Wayne Dyer's first book, and I love the stories he tells about how hard he worked to help make it a bestseller. Over 6 million copies have been sold. It's a no-nonsense, straight-to-the-point, how-to-quit-letting-negative-thinking-dominate-your-life kind of book, just the kind I love. And Dyer's super quotable, and the book's packed with big ideas. Let's have fun exploring some of my favorites, shall we? We'll start with the first big idea, taking charge of yourself. Quote, taking charge of yourself involves more than simply trying on new thoughts for size. It requires a determination to be happy and to challenge and destroy each and every thought that creates a self-mobilizing unhappiness in you. End quote. If you've read any Dyer, you know that one of his primary messages is change the way you look at things and the things you look at change. If we intend to take charge of ourselves and change our lives by changing the way we look at things, we can't do so casually. We can't just try on some new thoughts for size. We've got to have the determination to be happy and then, quote, challenge and destroy each and every thought that creates self-mobilizing unhappiness for us. So what thoughts do you know aren't serving you? Is now a good time to destroy them? It always is, isn't it? The next big idea is a veritable religion of the self. Quote, using yourself as a guide and not needing the approval of an outside force is the most religious experience you can have. It is a veritable religion of the self in which an individual determines his own behavior based upon his own conscience and the laws of his culture that work for him, rather than because someone has directed how he should behave. A careful look at Jesus Christ will reveal an extremely self-actualized person, an individual who preached self-reliance and was not afraid to incur disapproval. Yet many of his followers have twisted his teachings into a catechism of fear and self-hate. End quote. Self-reliance. It's perhaps the key message of the book. Dyer's a huge fan of Ralph Waldo Emerson and his essay, Self-Reliance. You can check out my notes on Emerson, and we've got the actual essay on the site, both the PDF and the MP3. I've read it at least a dozen or two times, and I highly recommend it. In Self-Reliance, Emerson says, quote, And truly, it demands something godlike in him who cast off the common motives of humanity and ventured to trust himself for a taskmaster. And he also reminds us that, quote, God will not have his work made manifest by cowards, end quote. So how's your self-reliance? Next big idea is self-worth versus other worth. Quote, self-worth cannot be verified by others. You are worthy because you say it is so. If you depend on others for your value, it is other worth, end quote. Other worth versus self-worth, that's classic. Do you depend on others for your sense of worth? Please stop doing that. We talk about this theme a lot because all the great teachers tell us how important it is to remain independent of the good or bad opinion of others. Seneca comes to mind here, and you can see the notes on Letters from a Stoic. He says, away with the world's opinion of you. It's always unsettled and divided. And just yesterday, I was reminded of this wisdom when I got an email from some random guy telling me how much he dislikes my notes and how I should quit sharing my opinions because, I quote, no one cares what you think, he says. (laughs) Ha, sweet dude. Thank you. Uh, Thankfully, in addition to a clear commitment to my work and style, 
I've received hundreds of emails from people telling me how much my energy and personal voice has inspired them to transform their lives. And I've learned to see that someone's criticism or praise is just a projection of what's going on with them. So I'm less attached to other people's opinions of me. But the funny part is that on the same day, I got a few other messages from peeps saying how much they liked the particular note that he found so lame. Alas, as Seneca says, quote, away with the world's opinion of you. It's always unsettled and divided. And Samuel Goldwyn says, don't pay any attention to the critics. Don't even ignore them. So are you getting caught up worrying too much about what other people think? Step back and realize that we simply can't please everyone all the time. And if we structure our lives attempting to do that, we're in trouble. We've got to find that inner sense of self-worth that's totally independent of the good or bad opinion of others. So let's notice when we feel tempted to trade our self-worth for other worth. All right? Very good. All right, the next big idea is there is nothing to worry about. Quote, there is nothing to worry about. Absolutely nothing. You can spend the rest of your life beginning right now worrying about the future and no amount of worry will change a thing. Remember that worry is defined as being immobilized in the present as a result of things that are going or not going to happen in the future. You must be careful not to confuse worrying with planning for the future. If you are planning and the present moment activity will contribute to a more effective future, then this is not worry. It is worry only when you are in any way immobilized now about a future happening, end quote. Worry, it qualifies as one of the lamest things we can do. Dyer says this, quote, If you believe that feeling bad or worrying long enough will change a past or future event, then you are residing on another planet with a different reality system. <laughs> Uh, that's great. And in his new book, The Big Leap, you can see the notes on that, Gay Hendricks says that worry is actually one of the key ways we sabotage ourselves and create what he calls artificial upper limits to our highest potential enjoyment in life. Gay Hendricks says, quote, worrying is usually a sign that we're upper limiting. It is usually not a sign that we're thinking about something useful. The crucial sign that we're worrying unnecessarily is when we're worrying about something we have no control over. Worrying is useful only if it concerns a topic we can actually do something about, and if it leads to our taking positive action right away. All other worry is just upper limit noise, designed by our unconscious to keep us safely within our zone of excellence or zone of competence, end quote. So the question is simple. Can you do something about whatever it is you're worrying about? If you can, do it. If you can't do anything about it, know that worrying about it is a complete and utter waste of time. Accept what is and then take the next most constructive action you can. So are you working out your worry muscles at the moment? Can you do anything about it? If so, rock it. You'll feel so much better the moment you take action. If you can't do anything about it, can you step back and see the big picture? Accepting what is and alchemizing it into the most positive experience you can. Perhaps by seeing the lesson in it or recognizing that, yeah, that part of your life currently sucks, but you only notice it so much because so many other areas are awesome. Always a fun way to think about it. Think about it. When you stub your toe, you notice that your toes hurt simply because it's very rare that something hurts that badly. But we fail to recognize that everything else is going great. So think about that. When something's going wrong, that's often a sign that Everything else is going great, so focus on the things that are going great and accept what is or do something about it. As Dyer says, quote, begin to view your present moment as times to live rather than to obsess about the future. When you catch yourself worrying, ask yourself, what am I avoiding now by using up this moment with worry? Then begin to attack whatever it is you're avoiding. The best antidote to worry is action, end quote. The next big idea is guilt is useless. Quote, guilt is the most useless of all erroneous behaviors. It is by far the greatest waste of emotional energy. Why? Because by definition, you are feeling immobilized in the present over something that has already taken place. And no amount of guilt can ever change history. End quote. Guilt, it's a waste of emotional energy. Last time I checked, you can't change the past, so wasting energy being guilty doesn't do a whole lot, huh? 
In the Diamond Cutter, you can see the notes on the book by Geshe Michael Roach, in which he applies the classic Tibetan sutra by the same name, the Diamond Cutter, to the creation of his diamond business. In that book, we learned that, quote, there's no word in Tibetan for guilty. The closest thing is intelligent regret that decides to do things differently. Isn't that amazing? There's no word in Tibetan for guilty. That's awesome. The closest thing they have is intelligent regret that decides to do things differently. So how about you? Got something you're feeling guilty about? Let's swap it out with the intelligent regret and joyfully decide to do things differently next time. Next big idea is believing in yourself fully. Quote, if you believe in yourself fully, no activity is beyond your potential. The entire gamut of human experience is yours to enjoy. Once you decide to venture into territory where you don't have guarantees, end quote. So if you convinced yourself that something is beyond your potential, check in on that. Because if you really want to experience it, it's not. Of course, achieving anything takes not only the knowing we can, but also the diligence, patience, and persistence to bring it to life in the face of all the evidence it's impossible. And ultimately, as Henry Ford says, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. So are you venturing into territory where you don't have any guarantees? Stay strong. Believe in yourself and take consistent, bold action in line with your deep belief in yourself. And that leads to the next big idea, a different kind of security. Quote, there is a different kind of security that is worth pursuing. And this is the internal security of trusting yourself to handle anything that may come down the pike. This is the only lasting security, the only real security. Things can break down, a depression can wipe out your money, your house can be repossessed, but you, you can be a rock of self-esteem. You can believe so much in you and your internal strength that things or others will be seen as mere pleasant but superfluous adjuncts to your life. End quote. That's great. It reminds me of Eric Butterworth's mojo and his great book, Spiritual Economics. You can see the notes on that. He says, quote, the word secure comes from two small Latin words, se, meaning without, and cure, meaning care, being without care, freedom from anxiety. Victor Hugo articulates this very special sense in this lovely couplet. Be like the bird that pausing in her flight, while on boughs too slight, feels them give way beneath her and yet sings knowing she hath wings, end quote. Beautiful. That book, Spiritual Economics, is fantastic. One of the most transformative reads for me, integrating my spirituality and economics. Check out the notes. And Dyer also says this, only the insecure strive for security. How do we get that belief in our inner strength? One of the keys, we need to be in integrity with our highest selves. When we consistently do the things that align with our highest vision of ourselves, whether it's getting up early to meditate or to exercise or to read or whatever, we build a deep level of self-trust that creates a magical energy so we know it's all good. We know we're strong enough to handle whatever the world brings us. Build your inner strength. Live your highest truths. Know that you have wings. The next big idea is paralyzed by perfection. Quote, why should you have to do everything well? Who is keeping score for you? Winston Churchill's famous lines about perfectionism indicate just how immobilizing the constant search for success can be. The maxim, nothing avails but perfection, may be spelled paralysis, Churchill said. You can paralyze yourself with perfectionistic do-your-best nonsense, end quote. How do you really feel, Wayne? <laughs> Tony Robbins says the same thing. He says that perfection is the absolute lowest standard you can ever have for yourself because it's impossible to attain. Rumi, you can see the notes on both Tony Robbins, Rumi, and uh, also Abraham Maslow, who I'm going to quote next. Rumi reminds us, there is no worse sickness for the soul, O you who are proud, than this pretense of perfection. Maslow says, there are no perfect human beings. Persons can be found who are good, very good indeed, in fact great. There do in fact exist creators, seers, sages, saints, shakers, and movers, even if they are uncommon and do not come by the dozen. 
And yet these very same people can at times be boring, irritating, petulant, selfish, angry, or depressed. To avoid disillusionment with human nature, we must first give up our illusions about it. So are you currently paralyzed by your need to be perfect? We've all been there, but it's time to get over yourself. You're not going to be the first human being to be perfect. So might as well take the precious time you have left here and go out and rock it, huh? In my own creative pursuits, I love combining two ideas. One, the angel's advocate, and two, thinking crappy. When you're first dreaming of an idea, allow yourself to explore everything that you hope goes right. What would happen if you had a little angel on your shoulder, waving its magic wand designing the perfect outcome? Spend some time in that before you get into the devil's advocate. Play with your angel's advocate. And then the next step, follow Guy Kawasaki's wisdom from a great book, Rules for Revolutionaries, and think crappy. It's one of the chapters in his book. Just get to work. Identify the first milestone you want to hit, whether it's a first draft of the business plan or a first date with a potential soulmate or whatever. Then just get to work. Think crappy and go for it. Then, as Kawasaki says, churn, baby, churn. As you move forward from your first crappy version, churn it so it evolves into a more and more beautiful masterpiece. That's how I've built three of my businesses, all three of my businesses. That's how I write and that's how I roll when I'm having fun and rocking every aspect of my life. Highly recommend it. So move through your paralysis by thinking crappy and just doing it. Let's get rid of our paralysis from perfectionism. This leads to the next big idea, masturbation. <laughs> Quote, there is a neat little word coined by Albert Ellis for the tendency to incorporate shoulds into your life. It is masturbation. You are masturbating whenever you find yourself behaving in ways that you feel you must, even though you might prefer some other form of behavior. But you don't have to masturbate, ever. It's all right to be lacking in composure or to not understand. You're allowed to be undignified if you choose to be. No one is keeping score on you or going to punish you for not being something that someone else said you must be. Besides, you can never be anything that you don't want to be all the time. It's just not possible. Therefore, any should will have to produce strain in you, since you won't be able to fulfill your erroneous expectation. The strain does not result from your undignified, non-supportive, indiscreet, or whatever behavior, but from the imposition of the should. End quote. Masturbation. That's got to be one of the best words ever. Masturbating is kind of like the idea of shooting all over yourself. Neither one is all that cool. What would life look like if we didn't masturbate and should on ourselves? We'd trust ourselves. We'd be self-reliant. We'd quit trying to be anything or anyone. We'd just be ourselves, authentically expressing ourselves moment to moment to moment. Sounds excellent. Another one of my favorite words. So let's just do it. Next big idea is how simple. Just do it. Quote, quit smoking now. Begin your diet this moment. Give up booze this second. Put this book down and do one push-up as your beginning exercise project. That's how you tackle problems, with action now. Do it. The only thing holding you back is you and the neurotic choices you've made because you don't believe you're as strong as you really are. How simple. Just do it. End quote. Reminds me of David Schwartz's uh, great wisdom in The Magic of Thinking Big, where he says, quote, action cures fear. Indecision, postponement, on the other hand, fertilize fear. Jot that down in your success rule book right now. Action cures fear, end quote. And Russell Simmons in his great book, Do You, you can see the notes on that as well, says, quote, the pain that's created by avoiding hard work is actually much worse than any pain created from the actual work itself. Because if you don't begin to work on those ideas that God has blessed you with, they will become stagnant inside of you and eventually begin to eat away at you. You might seem okay on the outside, but inside you will be ill from not getting those ideas out of your heart and into the world. Stalling leads to sickness, but taking steps, even baby steps, always leads to success. End quote. Simple question here. What do you need to do? Just do it. And the final big idea, look hard at your life. Quote, look hard at your life. 
Are you doing what you'd choose to be doing if you knew you had six months to live? If not, you'd better begin doing it because, relatively speaking, that's all you have. Given the eternity of time, 30 years or six months makes no difference. Your total lifetime is a mere speck. Delaying anything makes no sense. End quote. So what would you be doing if you had six months to live? If you're not currently doing that, what are you waiting for? Six months, 30, 50 years, relative to eternity, is there really a difference? Is now a good time to get out of your erroneous zones and get going with living? I thought so. All right, that is a quick look at your erroneous zones. I'm going to share a little bio on Wayne Dyer, suggest some other notes you might enjoy, and then read some quotes from the sidebar. So, Your Erroneous Zones is written by Dr. Wayne W. Dyer, who is an internationally renowned author and speaker in the field of self-development. He's the author of 30 books, has created many audio programs and videos, and has appeared on thousands of television and radio shows. His books, Manifest Your Destiny, Wisdom of the Ages, There's a Spiritual Solution to Every Problem, and the New York Times bestsellers, 10 Secrets for Success and Inner Peace, The Power of Intention, and Inspiration, and now, Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life, have all been featured as national public television specials. Dyer holds a doctorate in educational counseling from Wayne State University and was an associate professor at St. John's University in New York. That is adapted from Dr. Wayne dire.com where you can learn more and if you enjoyed this i think that you will also enjoy the notes on the power of intention real magic abraham maslow mastery seven habits of highly effective people everyday enlightenment the gifted adult and tony robbins and now some quotes how long am i going to be dead With that eternal perspective, you can now make your own choice and leave the worrying, the fears, the question of whether you can afford it, and the guilt to those who are going to be alive forever. (laughs) Dyer also says, they are too busy being to notice what their neighbors are doing. He quotes George Bernard Shaw, who says, people are always blaming their circumstances for what they are. I don't believe in circumstances. The people who get on in this world are the people who get up and look for the circumstances they want. And if they can't find them, make them. Abraham Lincoln says, I never had a policy that I could always apply. I've simply attempted to do what made the greatest amount of sense at the moment. Dyer says, not to succeed in a particular endeavor is not to fail as a person. It is simply not being successful with that particular trial at that particular present moment. And all the rest are from Dyer. He says, Teach those in your life who attempt to manipulate you with guilt that you are perfectly capable of handling their disappointment in you. You can choose to make any experience enjoyable and challenging. Give yourself shorter and shorter periods of worry time. Recognize the preposterousness of worry. Ask yourself over and over, Is there anything that will ever change as a result of my worrying about it? The need for approval is based on a simple assumption. Don't trust yourself. Check it out with someone else first. Surely your sojourn on earth is so brief, it ought to be pleasing to you. In a word, it's your life. Do with it what you want. That wraps up this note. Really hope you enjoyed it. I certainly enjoyed sharing it with you and trust you're doing great and look forward to sharing more. Have a great day. We hope you enjoyed this Philosopher's Note. Please go to www.philosophersnotes.com to download more.